So, so somehow I get punished when I show up to summits. I'm not sure who I pissed off and why, but I get the after lunch slot in every summit I go to. So my job is to keep you asleep, you know, comfortably, soothingly for the rest of the afternoon uh, until the next feature can come up and actually take my spot. So what, what I want to talk about today, though, for the, for the time that I've been allocated, is take a little bit of time to look at some of the open tools to look at threat intelligence, but also look at what this means for defense. And to get started here just a little bit to, to understand uh, what we're talking about in terms of hunting, what, what we're doing and what we're working on is not necessarily new. And I think one of the things that, one of the failures we have sometimes is we try to look at what we're doing and view it as something that no one's ever done before. And unfortunately what that means is we have to go back and relearn the lessons that other people have gone through and, and as a result, we lose that intelligence, we lose that opportunity. And it, it turns out, if we look in the 1940s, this is something that was going on then as well, from just a little bit somewhat different perspective. And what I'd like to do is start, is understand a little bit about that historic context, apply that to what we have today, and then how we can use that for better defense and the hunting skills that we're gonna actually be engaged with. And, and if we think about the German U-boats, and we look at some of the things that were going on um, about World War I, we look at World War II, even pre-World War I, it, it turns out there was a lot of pain caused by the German U-boats for obvious reasons, a lot of us know our history there, uh, and we saw, again, thousands of lives lost in, during those, that window of opportunity uh, where the Germans were able to use the, that particular weapon uh, to their advantage. And one of the things that we noticed is in the early days of hunting, we'll say, when talking about submarines, is you're faced with this problem. You had this open ocean and you said, okay, in this sort of mass of sea that you have, find the threat. And with the threat that you have, eliminate the threat. In fact, one of the things that happened in early days, prior to even World War I, is that it turns out that even the, the use of things like death charges was something completely brand new, uh, that attack tool wasn't even necessarily available. In fact, it turns out, prior to World War I, there were as many submarines sank because of gunfire, uh, because of death charges, and because of Navy captains ramming submarines. They had no other way to take these things down, and so literally they would just run into them because that was the only thing they could do to actually stop them from being a threat. And so one of the things that we look at, if we actually take a look at some of the different losses that were there, if we look at the period of time between 1939 and 1945, what you see is this gradual increase of attacks by German U-boats against ships crossing the Atlantic, and this is part of that battle for the Atlantic. And one of the things that's interesting is if you look at this graph, most of you will see the, the outlier right in the center, and you'll see sort of the monthly, and this is gonna graph by month, of the number of attacks that were taking place. And you'll see at the peak, we were generally seeing upwards of 200 attacks per month. Those are ships that were attacked and oftentimes sank during that window. But then all of a sudden in May of 1943, you see a drop off. And, and everyone, most historians who talk to will agree, it's something in May 1943 happened that caused a change in the way that this all occurred. Now, if we look at that graph and sort of understand, well, what was it? What was it that if we look in that particular window, had it dropped from almost 200 attacks per month down to about 20 attacks per month? What was it that kind of led us to that scenario? Now, a lot of people, of course, want to uh, give uh, Benedict Cumberbatch the credit for that or Alan Turing, and I, I get confused which one it is, but, but one of them, they wanted to give credit for the fact that the number went down. And, and don't get me wrong, what he did in the work on the fourth rotor uh, Enigma systems was amazing. It, it was great what he was able to do to provide intelligence to that community, but it was more than just intelligence that led to the success uh, of the, the Allied ships against the Navy that was there. And one of the things you see right away is you had the use of naval escorts and air cover. That was something that was used more predominantly in World War II than World War one and prior hadn't really been used before. In addition to that, they had improved detection equipment. There was constant improvements in some of the things that were going on with radio signaling, uh, looking at radar in general, looking at sonar capabilities and other things. They improved over time. There was increased detection capabilities. And those detection capabilities were put in the hands of naval captains to make good use of that during the course of their expeditions. In addition to that, we have improved offensive weapons. Again, the depth charges that were used, the torpedoes that were used, and other things, again, there were better opportunities to actually take out the submarines and U-boats that were detected. And there's improved training, and uh, again, for the, the hunters that were involved in this. And part of that training involved actively going after the submarines. 
prior to this, prior to World War II and prior to 1943, and we see this, this, this uh, attack slow down, what was happening was they would try to avoid it. And one of the primary defenses they would do, and actually you see that sort of listed under the intelligence side, is the idea of RF traffic analysis. One of the things that they would do is that they would say, we're gonna go ahead and look at traffic patterns. And they said we couldn't necessarily read them. And so even prior to Turing being able to go through and understand what some of those messages were, they could at least figure out where the signals were coming from. And if we saw signals coming from here, then what the ship captains would do is simply avoid that area. And they would go someplace else. But then what would the submarine captains do? They would watch for the traffic from the Allied commanders and they would move where the other ships were moving. And it became this game of cat and mouse that at the end of the day, it wasn't really working out. But it, what they did was they provided training to the hunters as well to give them increased capability to figure out what they needed to do to detect these ships, uh, these submarines, U-boats that were there and available. But it, part of this then was defense. That there were these defensive activities going on that the Allies were engaged in. In addition to that, what we see is we see better intelligence. Again, the RF traffic analysis that was taking place, and of course, certainly we wanna talk about what Turing did uh, and the, the decryption of the offensive information that was being given to these U-boat captains. The thing what I'm trying to explain here is that these things work together to provide defense. And even though I know certainly we're at a threat hunting summit and I don't wanna minimize that role at all, I think this is a part of the equation. I think one of the challenges, and sort of if I can give maybe a flavor to what I'm gonna be able to talk about for the next few minutes, is this is one piece of the overall pie for defense that we're trying to achieve. If you tried to say, we wanna go ahead and do, uh, let's say, better response or better hunting without the presence of the tools that are in place, I think it's gonna be a lot more frustrating that we try to do. In fact, what I think we're gonna find in many of us, that we find ourselves here uh, in a challenging situation where resources just aren't being allocated like we'd like. And as a result, you know, we may talk about situations like let's say with carbon black up here earlier, and I think a lot of us would agree, wow, it's an amazing toolkit. They have a lot of really great things they could do. Or even if we don't talk about carbon black, just talk about application whitelisting in general. And to a large degree, some of the work that we're doing is because frankly, we don't have the resources or the time or the maybe political will to be able to do things like that whitelisting we're describing. So what I wanna start with is we talk about sort of history then. There's this, this understanding of threat, layered defenses, layered, uh, again, offense, or I'm sorry, detective and preventive uh, detects are there, threat intelligence, and again, these intelligent hunters and operators that have the ability to work together. You know, Rob and I joked a little bit about the idea of how much can this be automated versus how much is a manual activity that's here. And what we're trying to suggest is that it's going to be a combination. You're going to have automation that helps. What it's gonna do is it's gonna help you, what we're gonna call as we go through the day, uh, define the battlefield you have an opportunity not only to look at this ocean and say, let's see what's out there, but you have an opportunity to narrow down the battlefield to say, this is where we know the attack will take place. And that's something that the submarine commander, or the submarine uh, again, hunters didn't have the opportunity to do back in World War II. So a couple of things we're gonna start with. Unclear definitions of threat are gonna lead us to unclear definitions or architectures for defense. If we don't know what it is we're trying to defend against, it turns out it's very difficult for us to agree how we're going to actually defend ourselves. And so that's a big part of our problem today. And along with that, one of the things I think that we've discovered is that there really are limited taxonomies for threat. A couple of years ago, when we started some of the projects I'll reference in a few minutes, there were literally, as of a year and a half ago, zero taxonomies of threat that you could get a hold of. And so over the last about 18 months or so, there are three of them now. Uh, we run one of them, and uh, NISA has run one, uh, and MITRE has done some more research on their side as well. But because of this though, we have now more tools, more information that we can use for the purpose then of hunting, uh, and again, on the defensive side as well. So we say this a different way, how do we go about blocking malicious ha hashes if we don't have a whitelisting tool? It's great if we can get the hash, but if we don't have a way to block, how are we gonna actually take advantage of that? Or if we have IDS signatures, but we don't have an IDS, how do we actually respond? Or how do we analyze traffic from the malicious code passing across our networks if we don't have packet captures? And it sounds so basic, but I feel like I'm in the position where I'm telling everyone, you have to eat your vegetables before you can go out and do some of the more advanced, some of the funner things. And I think the trouble that a lot of the organizations we work with in every single day is still, people still don't have whitelisting. People still don't have IDSs people still rarely, uh, outside of their border, do packet captures. And so without these tools, it makes it really difficult for us to do response. I had an incident response case a couple years back, and it was a very large media company. 
And in dealing with them, they said, we have, we have found this information. We found they're, they're being hosted with a, a web dropper up off the, their website. Uh, and they're infecting people visiting their site and such, like using the Forbes.com. That, that sort of thing was going on. And so they got us involved, went, went, to, their inf went to their information uh, team. And we said, listen, all right, we want to respond. And they said, OK, great. They said, because we want to take these people to court. We want to take these people down. We want to find out who did this to us. We are convinced you know, that this is evilness, and we, we want to take care of this. We said, great. So let's look at you know, what do you have on the, the log side regarding what's been happening on these systems. And they said, well, we don't have logs, because that, that's something that somebody else handles. And, and we don't have access to those systems, and we don't have logs. I said, OK, fine. I said, well, do you have at least you know, disk images that we can look at, maybe see some of the artifacts that are present from the disk perspective? I said, well, no, it's on a hosting company, and we don't have access to those, and they won't give us access. I said, OK. I said, do you have anything in, in terms of, let's say, memory? The same thing. I said, no, we don't have memory, nothing like that we can play with. I said, OK, any packet captures, any logs, anything whatsoever we can look at? They said, no, we have the dropper. We have the malware itself. And so we want to prosecute. So here's a dropper, it's PHP code, and sure enough, it's used by all sorts of exploit kits, but we want a, you to tell us who did this to us so that we can prosecute them. And, and of course, as, as most of us know, it's not gonna happen. It's not gonna be something that's gonna be a reality, but what we're trying to suggest is let's put the defenses in place, maybe not to prosecute, but at least to have the ability to respond when we find these events taking place. That's what we're gonna be suggesting here today. Case in point, APT1. This was released a few years ago. This is not something new. Most of us are aware of the APT1 report. You're aware of Comment Crew. You're aware of Ugly Gorilla. Hopefully, we all read this report. It was very good when it came out. There's a number of others. CrowdStrike has some good ones. A lot of good reports similar to this that have come out since uh, the APT1 report came, came out. In the appendix, now the report itself is great. I think a lot of us probably read that, what the 30-some pages, because it was sort of a spy novel, uh, as many of you read. But of course, where the real meat and the value was that came out of this was in the appendix. And if you look in the appendix, what do we see? We saw over 3,000 specific indicators of compromise. Okay, so listed there. Names like the names of the exploits, the actual file names that you could look at. In fact, there's regular expressions that you could really easily have written based on some of the exploits that were discovered. Output files written in a certain format that, again, if we looked at that information, it'd be easy enough for us to be able to figure out how to write regex expressions to look for those output files that we're using. 13 certificates used during the compromises. 40 different malware families, many of which were just off-the-shelf pieces of malware anyways, but we had access to those, those signatures that we could use. And at the time when this was released, we asked people, okay, here we go. We have the names of, of domains in the certificates that you can look for. We have the names of domains that we know are being used in some cases for command and control. And so we said, great, can you go look in your DNS logs to pull this information out? And organization after organization said, uh, yeah, we don't have those logs. And so here we have intelligence. We're handing you intelligence. The industry is giving you information that you can do to, to detect badness, right? Here's one of these APT groups, but yet most of the organizations that we dealt with, at least, had no idea what to do with it. I'm not saying there's any trouble with our intelligence. I'm just saying we've got to be able to use it, though, for this to be valuable for our organizations. So there are some prereqs to get into this industry and actually start playing uh, like we'd like. So the model that we're going to suggest is something along these lines here. The idea is enter at any point, but if we have threat intelligence, so if we can get access to this information, that threat intelligence, in our opinion, should lead to the selection of controls. Because depending on the type of information that you're given, you may need extra detective capability to detect the badness that's taking place. So again, Take your threat intelligence, identify it, classify it, and understand what sort of detective mechanisms or artifacts do we need because of what's discovered. Use that to select controls. Use our selection to implement. Actually do the thing that we know is the right thing to do. And then from there, we can detect evil. Once we've detected evil, we can use that to increase or sort of improve the threat intelligence that we have access to, and of course, repeat this cycle. Now, imagine we can do this as an industry and not just you as your own, on your own, not just with the handshakes of the people that you meet at these events. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think some of the best intelligence I've ever received has been by ten, attending events like this, meeting people in hallways, you know, having those friend DAs in place right, with the people around us, and then learning from the people that we talk to. But at the same time, what if we got more formalized and actually started sharing that information so that we could do better as an industry? That's a suggestion that we're going to hope for. Now, that being said, our thought, of course, is that threat identification, threat definition, should lead to control or countermeasure definition. 
If we know how bad behavior is taking place, if we know what evil looks like, then we should be able to put detective controls in place to stop the evil, and then also hopefully, ideally, even prevent some of the evil that's there. Now, this isn't gonna be a perfect process. As many of you have, deal, uh, have dealt with the information sharing and analysis centers, the ISACs that are out there, many of you know a lot of the ISAC data is great, but there's also delays. It takes a little bit of time to get that information, to actually get into people's hands, to get it processed. But even if we only have access to some of those basic data sets that are available to us, we can use that to weed out some of the noise. And we can start to use the rest of our attention to focus on what's really unique in our environment. There's going to be a lot of noise, and, and yes, maybe threat hunting isn't going to be completely automated, but we can use some of the automation tools we have to limit the noise that's in place so we can focus on the things that are unique to us. And that's the part that I believe may be more useful of your time. So get, let's get an example. And one of the things I know that Carbon Black had an opportunity to talk about, and rightfully so, uh, is a lot of the different PowerShell attacks that are out there. There's been a few different uh, allusions to uh, the idea that PowerShell attacks that are out there. Uh, if you're not investi investigating Windows remote management and some of those tools, you probably want to spend a little time looking into that. To be fair, I've heard a lot of people, especially on the pen test side, make recommendations saying, hey, you need to turn off Windows remote management because these invoke command commands that you saw people talking about earlier this morning, those are useful if you enable those functions. And that's fine, and I get why we'd want to do that, but at the same time, it also makes it easier for your sysadmins, for your defenders, to look for badness, to look for evil like we saw earlier. My take on it is honestly, disabling WinRM is basically like saying, let's get rid of TCP IP, because if we have TCP IP, it makes it way too easy for the attackers to break into our systems. So again, you can have the conversation, but again, let's, let's look at, this is one of the, the, um, the malware pieces, this is PowerShell ransomware. Uh, that uh, Trend Micro detected a couple years ago. Uh, a lot of you have been reading about it in the news lately. Uh, this actually has been detected as early as 2013, if not earlier. I found at least references to 2013 for this malware. But let's say that we have an example of ransomware along these lines. And I know a lot of people have looked at things like PowerShell-based ransomware and said this is a little scarier, it's not an EXE, it's not an MSI, so I've got a little more fear around this. You know, could I, again, actually detect uh, that script file that's there? Because I want to be able to allow PowerShell EXE to execute, but how do I make sure I limit, let's say, the ransomware here from executing, but yet still allow PowerShell EXE to run? Well, it turns out most of your whitelisting solutions are gonna have different settings available. Even if you just use AppLocker from Microsoft, right, the basic stuff built in for free, Windows 7 and later, it's there for you to use. It has a differentiator between EXEs, MSIs, and the PowerShell scripts. So you can say, apply this logic to your scripts and this logic to your EXEs. So let's say that we know the attack, in this case the threat, is ransomware that, that comes out, again, via PowerShell so that it would seem then that threat intelligence, if someone tells us, hey, this is evil, you need to be aware of this, then the proper response to evil is, okay, well, how do we detect it? How do we stop it from executing? And if we think of us in terms of, let's say, a control, we could use, say, Carbon 9, or Carbon Black, or um, the Bit 9 tools, uh, we could use AppLocker or something similar to say, let's stop this from executing. And so we can use that as a control, as a defense. Of course, a threat consequence would be data encryption, data loss, uh, you know, all those kind of things that, that you see people dealing with now um, because of the ransomware that's out there. So a couple of things to think about then from our standpoint. So as we started to talk about this more and more in, in some of the risk discussions we were having, not as a part of threat hunting, but as a part of risk discussions and control selection then, we started to say, is there a point though when it comes to the defensive side where maybe the intelligence has a point of diminishing returns. In other words, could I get to a point where I get overwhelmed by the intelligence that's available to me, and, and as a result, I get so focused spending my time analyzing that data set that I don't actually defend myself, or that I don't actually have time to do the hunting that we're describing. And the, the theme that I hear perpetually, and 100% and of the organizations that we talk to, is that there's never enough time. If there's never enough time, then we need to do everything in our power to focus ourselves and focus the time that we have so that we're focusing our energies on the things that honestly make sense for us. So the question we have then, does a taxonomy of threat agents influence control selection? In other words, if you knew who the bad guys were, does this change the way you behave? If I tell you it's a Syrian electronic army, or I tell you it's comment crew, does it matter? 
do you care which of them is running, let's say, SQL injection attacks against you? Would we change our defenses as a result of that? Or said another way, do we need to know specific threat agents? Or does threat intelligence, in many of these cases, change our control selection? Or is just enough data good enough to make good decisions to actually do defense? So let's take an example. Let's say that we're dealing with web server attacks. Okay, so let's say that we look at OWASP data for the top 10 web threats uh, that they released in 2013. We all know OWASP, a lot of you have read their studies, great resources, uh, we all love them, so hopefully you're, you're participating in what's going on over there. But we see here in the list, this was their list of threats that they released in 2013. Well, let's do a little case study with this. So let's say that's the threat list that they've released. That's their industry research. This is the threat intelligence that they're providing you. They're saying, this is how the bad guys are getting in to your web apps, okay? So this is it, based on their research. Every few years, they change this list. And we say, all right, let's see if that's actually true. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at my web logs and compare my web logs to what I see over from OWASP. Let's see if this is gonna be true. Because maybe the information I have on my systems, maybe I'm being targeted, maybe the attackers who are going after me have a slightly different idea or different tool sets that they're gonna be using. So I say, okay, so let me look at the data that I have and compare it to what OWASP is telling me. So I look at my list here and we say, okay, the, the first bar there is gonna be their number one for injection, uh, or number two will be authentication. And you see, well, number two does appear to be a little bit lower than number three, but it's not that far off, so I probably shouldn't panic too much. But number four seems quite a bit lower than number five. And if I look at, okay, insecure direct object references, number four, in my logs, I don't see that as much as maybe security misconfiguration, number five, that green bar in the middle. Of course, this is all completely made up. But let's say this is what we discover. And my list doesn't quite match up. I mean, it sort of matches, but not completely with what OWASP is saying. Okay, so I say, well, maybe it's a normalization issue. Maybe they're just, I haven't looked at it for a long enough period of time, right? Very obviously, right? So okay, so I say, well, let's look at the data from a little longer perspective. And so I take multiple years worth of data because I actually save this. Okay, now how many of us have this information? Probably very few of you, but let's pretend that we did. Let's pretend that we're data hoarders and that we save these logs and we really want to know what this is all about. So we save the information, again, we look, and we're, we think, oh my gosh, now I'm even more confused. Because originally, if I look at the green bar there in 2014, it looks like I had certain attacks taking place, but now I've got cross-site scripting keeps popping up in 2015 that I wasn't seeing before. I still see direct object references taking place less or fewer times than others, but security misconfiguration, while a big deal in 2014, is much less in 2015. So let's say all this is true now, and I look at all this information that's there, data-wise there, so I ask myself, should I implement a web application firewall? Does it make a difference, any of the data that I've collected, does it change my opinion on whether I should influence or put in a web app firewall or not? And I think most of us would probably say, well, yeah, that kind of makes sense because it's gonna stop a lot of the things that we're talking about here. And it brings in mind how, how are we gonna actually detect this stuff to begin with, right? I know, absolutely. All right, what about should we stop scanning our applications for vulnerabilities based on the fact that we see different data sets than OWASP? Should we say, you know what, we have web inspect or app scan, let's toss it, All right? What's the value here because my data doesn't match? Well, it's stupid, right? And of course we're gonna still scan our application for vulnerabilities. So if we look at some of this information, I guess my question at the end of the day I'm gonna ask is, are we gonna change our defense at all based on the information we've gathered. Now, if over enough time, to be completely fair, if we go back and look at some of these lists, if you look at number eight, cross-site request forgeries, if we look at about eight or 10 years ago, that didn't show up on the list. If I look at the OWASP list from, again, about eight, eight or 10 years ago, that one wasn't there. People said that's theoretical, that doesn't actually happen, we can't believe that's a real attack. But now, today, we know it's not as hard as people think it is. So maybe we said, yeah, after about this five, eight year, 10 year period, we're gonna change our defenses a little bit to stop against those cross-site request forgery attacks. Okay, fine, that, that's a valid response that you would have. So again, if I look at this, the thought is again, although the frequencies may change, we still know what the general categories of threat are that are facing these particular web applications that we have. So not implementing these controls for a particular threat might possibly indicate still risk for us. If I say, I'm just gonna to try to fix the top three or the top five on that list, the other threats don't go away. 
even if we're talking about this in terms of risk management or something, people like to say, well, you know, we're going to implement risk management or risk-based approach to control selection, and that's great, but that doesn't mean that all of a sudden you're not vulnerable if you don't address those lower ones just because you don't have enough money to deal with it. Okay, there's still going to be something that can cause harm to your system. So documented prioritizations, it turns out, are not a valid defense. People aren't going to look at your exception forms to say, huh, I see that you didn't implement whitelisting because you felt like it was too difficult and not politically going to be accepted in the company. You know what? I'm not going to run my, my disk-based binaries against you because you have an exception form written in this space. Of course, again, that's, of course we know that that's crap. But again, the point being, again, we, we use this, but I think there's a point potentially of diminishing returns that we look at. And of course, the question, of course, there was another vendor that I may or may not wanted to have put on the slide, but for the sake of kindliness, decided not to. Uh, but put threat, but let's say, uh, on the map instead. But is the pew pew map really what we're looking for? Or is it something maybe to help us on the defense? And I think, unfortunately, sometimes this is, you know, what we don't always like to admit it, but maybe what we're looking for a little bit uh, in some of our defenses. So here's our solution. Here's what we're recommending. Number one, if you understand threat, organizations who see badness, we believe, should share what they know. If you're detecting it, if you're working with an ISAC, if you're working with organizations who see badness, we say you should share what you've learned about. And if you listen to President Obama, the beginning of last year, what did he say? He went to Stanford, he stood up, he created some new positions in the federal government, and he said, the problem we have is that we don't share data. And that's what was the solution. They proposed sharing more information. And there is some truth to that. It's not probably the only thing, but part of the solution is we do need to share a little bit more than we do. Uh, we've been getting better about this, uh, maybe about the last maybe six or seven years. Remember, it's not been that long since we didn't even admit to each other that we had breaches. Eight years ago, nine years ago, remember, we didn't even talk about this stuff. So it's not to say in another five years, maybe we do start sharing a little bit more, not just about the breaches taking place, but about the threats that we're seeing too. The other thing then we're suggesting is that that information you share be classified in such a way that we can use that to make good control decisions as a community. If we can all look at what are those threats that we're seeing, we classify those threats, then we can turn that into some sort of taxonomy that we can all agree on, then we can use that taxonomy, hopefully, to define and prioritize the defensive controls that we want to put into place to actually defend ourselves. And some of those that we're going to all agree to will be detective in nature. They're going to be the IDSs. They're going to be the Yaras. They're going to be these tools that we can use for the purpose of finding badness and finding the evil that's around us there. And then hopefully, we would implement those controls that were suggested to us. Implementing controls then, paired with threat intelligence, can be used to detect specific attacks. And my fear, the thing that worries me still, is that sometimes we get really excited about these buzzwords, and we say, let's go focus on, let's say, one of the detective tools, as opposed to going out and actually trying to stop the badness in the first place. We say, let's go out. And, and I've, I've heard this with the ransomware cases, especially here recently. I keep seeing recommendations from like Health and Human Services and other groups, and especially because a lot of hospitals and healthcare groups are getting hit by this. I saw Health and Human Services and a couple of other FBI came out and they said, listen, the response to ransomware is you should really make sure you've got good backups. You should really make sure you've got good business continuity. And I'm, I'm good with that, right? I, I get the importance of that. But why can't we say whitelisting? Why can't we start with a thing that we all know is going to stop that from taking place? And that's the sort of thing we want to have conversations about. So we'll come to questions in just a couple minutes. All right, so the thought is that then we don't want to jump to step five. We don't want to just sort of jump to the end. But what if we could jump to step five? What if you go home and you don't have to do steps one through four? Wouldn't it be cool if we could just jump right to using other people's data for the purpose of defense, like we see there? But it turns out language matters. And I've heard it this way already this morning, right? Language matters, right? If we say, let's eat, grandma, it's different than let's eat, grandma, right? It, it makes a difference. The words that we use matter. And that's one of the things uh, that we've been working with here over the last few months. It turns out in 2015 and 2016 that it turns out that if I looked at the vendor threat reports, and by the way, this is kind of what we do, as crazy as it sounds, 
we enjoy reading those reports. Now, to be fair, as Rob sort of indicated, uh, we do a lot of work with the Center for Internet Security, uh, and we volunteer in a lot of other places like that. Uh, a lot of the researchers have been willing to come to us, the Verizons and others, uh, and talk to us about integrating things from the critical security controls and similar projects into their threat reports. So we have a lot of insight into some of the things that Symantec and Verizon and others are putting out. But anyways, if we look at the list of some of the things, though, that were listed as threats in 2015 and 16, some of these I can kind of understand, like Iranian hackers or the Chinese hacking groups or the crime war exploit toolkits. I mean, these sort of sound like threats to me. But no joke, the Internet of Things, laptops, and point of sale systems were listed in the same reports as the Syrian Electronic Army. So does that mean if I see the Syrian Electronic Army in my network, I should be scared? And I think the answer is yes. But if I see, let's say, a point of sale system, does that mean I should have the same level of fear about a point of sale system in my environment? Is that as big of a threat to me as a steering electronic army? And it sounds like there's a definition problem. It sounds like, yes, I understand that there are, let's say, quote unquote, threats here that we're dealing with. But it seems to me threat agents, sometimes we'll refer to this as threat sources. I sort of like agents here, though. That's kind of what I've been going with lately. Threat agents perform threat actions against threat targets in order to achieve threat consequences. So it's a combination of these things working together. And in fact, these, these seem to be the buckets that we want to use to maybe break things up. So yes, the Syrian Electronic Army would be an agent, just like Mother Nature would be an agent, but a point of sale system might be, let's say, a target. Okay, so again, we can separate these definitions out. So what would seem to be is we need to have some sort of definition around this and actually try as a community to come up with what are the agreed upon terms. Let's actually decide what are these threats in these different categories. Let's define the categories and maybe even move towards a taxonomy and use the things as a community that we have at our disposal. So it turns out this is not a made up thing. It turns out this is a project we've been working on for the last couple of years. The tool that I would sort of start you all with today is the use of what we call the open threat taxonomy. The Open Threat Taxonomy was originally released for the purpose of doing the things we just talked about. In fact, we have a new version of this that we're working on right now. Uh, so uh, we are actually literally in the middle of a review cycle right now. I was kind of hoping we'd be done by it before we got here this week, um, but we are making progress. We've got a great group of over 150 different organizations represented, uh, anything from the FBI to uh, Microsoft and Verizon and uh, the World Bank and a number of other agencies, SANS, a bunch of pen test teams. And so a lot of good groups, good people willing to volunteer their time, because that's all we are. We're just volunteers trying to bring good information together so that we can define some of these threats that we've been talking about and do the things that we've been describing. So that being said, we wanted to understand what are the categories of threats, come up with a hierarchy of these, come up with an inventory, and then once we have that language and we agree on what the inventory looks like, we can then even go ahead and give prioritizations to what we feel like the threats are that we've identified. Now, the cool thing is, is once we know that, if we all agree on what the taxonomy looks like, over the first couple of years, sure, we're gonna see massive changes in the taxonomy because we're all gonna disagree and we're gonna fight over things. Uh, and as Tony Sager, one of the, the guys that, that um, sort of leads a project for us at CIS, talks about a lot is that we're gonna agree on 90% of what we're gonna do in these projects, but we'll also fight to the death over the remaining 10%. And so there's gonna be a lot of changes as we get started, but as those changes mature, and as we sort of decide what really needs to be in here, over time, we don't so much change the taxonomy as we turn dials. We agree on what the attacks and what the threats might be, but now we just say, you know what? This month it appears SQL injection is a little bit bigger of an issue. Next month, it appears that some of these scripting-based um, uh, applications, maybe it's a PowerShell attack or power, encoded PowerShell commands that are run, uh, maybe that's more of a threat. And we turn those dials to target and focus on those a little bit more. The point being is we can at least agree on the taxonomy. We can develop defensive infrastructures to get started. The nice thing is, is that we're not building this in a vacuum. There's a lot of good sources that are out there that we can take advantage of. Again, I mentioned uh, Anissa. Uh, they've got a great taxonomy they literally just released in January. Um, it's not quite as broad as I wish it would be, but it's still really good. And so I would definitely recommend you check that out. Uh, MITRE has always done some really good work. They're CAPEX. Again, a little focused, but still very good work that's there. Number of other groups that are there. General Motors, so again, give them some credit uh, from this morning as well. They've got a really nice threat taxonomy that they've got as a few different groups that are like that out there. We can define things though. We can say, these are the kind of agents we might figure out that are there. 
and maybe again we say nation states, but we at least acknowledge that the agents are present. And so we put this into the taxonomy. Or we've looked at, let's say specifically, uh, we'll see the next slide there, hopefully. There we go. Look at some of the high level versions of threat that we actually see. And one of the things that we wanted to do was, as a part of the scope of the project, we wanted to identify was, is that it's not just SQL injection. It's not just PowerShell scripts. It turns out we've identified a lot of other threats to systems that frankly may not show up as a result of a binary scan. So we have some other categories of personnel based and other things that are probably worth discussing when you have a little more time. We want to map those. In fact, in the current version, we're mapping these to the threat reports to make it easier for you to go ahead and analyze the threats that are out there. And it's going to be based on what we're going to consider a community-based risk assessment. So you're not having to come up with this on your own. We want to be able to build consensus. The output of this should then be controls that also you don't have to select. And that's the whole point of the critical security controls. V next, whatever that actually ends up being, uh, we do plan on basing uh, on two things. Number one, what we're calling the community attack model, which is sort of a higher le level abstraction of threat. And in addition to that, also some of the things we're identifying in the taxonomy. So we make sure we're being comprehensive uh, in the, the attacks, in the controls, I should say, uh, that we're putting in place. Again, this is from the Center for Internet Security. For those of you who haven't seen this project, uh, what we're trying to do, again, is look at not just any potential threat, but specifically the technical threats to systems, including uh, trying to understand some of the detective controls that we can put in place. Uh, there are some side projects that are going on. Uh, some, we have some European intelligence agencies who have gotten together and are also doing some research on how do we take these controls, look at what sort of artifacts we can detect with the sensors deployed by these controls to make, again, a consistent language, a consistent way of reporting on some of the, the threat indicators uh, that we're discovering. So there are a lot of different free open source tools that are out there, threat models, preventive detective defenses, threat intelligence. Our hope is the research is done. It's an opportunity now for us to act. And if said another way, I still love the quote from General Hayden. I know a lot of you have seen it, but it's still one of my favorites. Quit whining, act like a man, and defend yourself. Black Hat 2010. So that being said, if you are interested in helping on some of these things, I have to give a little bit of a plea. We do really appreciate help. If you have access to data sets, if you're willing to share some of the information that you have, the only way this is successful is if we work together to share some of the intelligence, some of the things that we've been collecting. It's only a good project, it's only a good tool if it's something we can truly collaborate about. It can't just be that we talk about doing that. So that being said, uh, my contact information is there, honestly. Um, if you wanna reach out, we could really use the help. Uh, we've got a lot of different groups that are involved already, but always are willing to have more. So appreciate your time on that today. Huh?